Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Secrets for an Inspirational Life. How are you all today or this evening, wherever you may be in the world? Here in the United Kingdom, it's sort of late afternoon, um, a little bit wet and windy where I am, but I hope wherever you are in the world, there's something beautiful to accompany you. Now, it's a funny old world, isn't it, at the moment? But irrespective of that, there are some things that we need to remind ourselves of. And that is that our whole life is, in effect, a series of memories. Whether that be good, whether that be not so good, each and everything that happens to us, I believe, happens for a reason. And every single person that we meet in this life also is for a reason. It may be someone that we meet in the street or maybe someone that we have a little bit longer with. It's really irrelevant the amount of time that we spend with somebody. What is important is that we are fully present in that moment with that person because we have so much that we can share with each other. And even though now it can be a little bit more difficult, it really isn't impossible because there's so many ways of communicating. And I read somewhere the other day that it's something that I you know, believed all of my life is that we are really multidimensional beings who have so much to give to each other, to life. And only one ray of that is upon this earth. We can, if we open our hearts and our soul, reach a huge vastness across the worlds and indeed connect in a far more deeper way with each other than we have ever been able to before. Now, I am really delighted to welcome my guest today, who is the very lovely Claire Honeyfield. Now, Claire does so many things, but I'm going to read you a little bit and tell you a little bit about what she does. She is a coach who works with entrepreneurs and creatives, as well as being a mentor, a yoga teacher, a speaker, and a published author. She also works as a consultant specializing in ethical and community retail. Claire is the founding director of the National Association of Farmers Markets and is the founder of Stroud Farmers Market, which is in the UK, by the way, which was launched by Isabella Blow and Jasper Conran in 1999. She was also a co-founder of Gloucestershire Food Links, working with healthy school meals, education and food inclusion from field to plate. And she also founded the Gloucestershire Association of Farmers Markets, something I love. I absolutely adore farmers markets. Since 2012, Claire has been the sole, sole director of Made in Stroud Shop, which she helped to set up as a cooperative of 25 local makers. Now working with 160 makers, the shop runs as a successful social enterprise, is a plastic-free champion, runs by strict environmental policies and has been nominated for and won multiple awards. So this lady does so many things. And today she's going to share her wonderful life journey with us. <laughs> Welcome, Claire. Thank you, Mimi. So lovely to talk to you. Oh, and you too. How are you today? Yeah, I'm good, thanks. Yeah, yeah. good. Yeah. How is the weather where you are? It's quite drizzly today, but... Uh, you know, I was I was at the supermarket checkout recently mm -hmm. and uh, the person at the checkout said to me, oh, it looks miserable out there. And I said, you know, the thing about when it rains in lockdown is at least everything feels different. Yes, that's true. That's very, very same, true. Same, same, same. Mm, mm, 
absolutely. I like the feeling of the rain on my skin now. Do you like it? I do now. I've come to appreciate it this year. You know, funny you should say that. Um, I was in a far-flung country in the desert a few years back and there was no rain. And I remember thinking to myself, Mimi, when you get back to rainy England, do not ever complain about the rain. Exactly. And I found a different, as you said, relationship with rain even. Yeah. Because, yeah. And even in lockdown, I every time it rains, I go outside because I want to feel the rain. Isn't that funny? Yeah. Yes. yes. Yeah. I totally get that. I don't yes. know. What is that, do you think? Is it that we want to feel more or we have a different interpretation about it things now well I think um for me one of the things about lockdown has been the um much reduced sensory input so normally I go to a lot of festivals in the summer which means I see a lot of performance art I usually spend a couple of nights out dancing at festivals I usually get dressed up, see other people dressed up, see some incredible acts, um, you know, all the amazing lighting and costumes and all of the incredible variety of entertainment that you get at a festival in the UK and installations and art. And, um, And this year I've seen a lot of... Uh, the view out of my window. <laughs> yes, yes. And, the, and a lot of my flat. Mm. And uh, I think that that reduced sensory input has given me a new appreciation for any change. Whether it's sunshine on my skin or rain on my skin or mm. a warm breeze or noticing a really bright crescent moon like I did this week, that kind of thing. Yes, it's really important, I think, to be aware in these times. And I feel that somehow someone, you know, shakes you and wakes you and says, you know, look out there, there is this world. There is this beautiful world. There's these beautiful things happening that, as you said, you know, we take so much for granted. Yes, like the way that we used to be able to communicate and socialise, I took that Mm. so very much for granted and I'm a very social being. Mm. Mm. um, Now I have an appreciation for conversation that I didn't necessarily have before. Yeah, I mean, I don't know about you, Claire, but um, I, I have this thing of where... I love everyone. And then I have days where I don't want to be friendly with anyone. Yes, and uh, it's just one of the, you know, it's just one of those things. But I'm in yeah. the frame of mind at the moment where I could kiss everybody's hand and say, you know what? I really miss you. Yes. And it's this deep respect and compassion for another human being. Yes, very much so. Mm. And, and one of the things that I found really necessary during the first lockdown was to have a gratitude journal. Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah, so I've been gratitude journaling for a while now, a few years. Uh, And you know that when we write a gratitude journal, we are creating new neural pathways in the brain. Um, Obviously, we, with whatever we do in our lives, we're creating new neural pathways all the time. Mm. And, and the thing about gratitude is that after 21 days of writing a gratitude journal, we cultivate that practice in ourselves, the practice of gratitude. And, and I found that I, I lost the practice of gratitude during the first lockdown because I felt quite shocked, actually. Mm-hmm. I felt like I was in shock to begin with. And by really cultivating that gratitude again, I... I wouldn't say that it was a time that I enjoyed, but I was able to use the time better. Yes, it's 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 a funny old thing in a way. It's a little bit of a double edged sword. Um, But 
even things like, I don't know, food deliveries. Yes. And I'm so grateful for my lemons. I know yes. it's crazy, yeah. but, you know, I'm so grateful yes. that I can get a lemon. Yeah. Because I really like lemon tea with honey. Yes. Yeah. It's one of my things. And I look at the lemon now in a completely different way. Yeah, I, I, I mean, do you I agree? Totally, yes, I totally agree. Um, mm. I've definitely started eating a lot more fresh fruit and vegetables since since the beginning of the first lockdown. Uh, I have a different appreciation of everything because everything seems so more important. Yeah, it, it, it's true. I mean... I had a funny incident, um, but I'm going to ask you a little bit about what you do in a moment. But okay. while we're on this sort of train of thought, this lovely train of thought, although the next story is a bit strange, I have to say. I was <laughs> in the garden and we live in the countryside. And um, do you know what I found? I saw a scorpion. Wow. Well. In the I UK? Was, yes. Wow. Well, I, I didn't know they existed, so I had to Google yeah. it and ask a few people. But did you know it was very common? No, I had no idea. Well, no, neither did I. <laughs> I. I was outside the log cabin and um, it was dark. And then the lights, you know, those automatic lights that come on when, you know, sensor lights that come yes. on. And I saw something and I thought, this is very odd. And I have a fear of them because travelling sort of, I saw a few and they're, they're not very nice. Have you ever... Yeah met a scorpion no as such. i'm right. really glad that i haven't <laughs> right yes you you should be so <laughs> they're really scary be. they're scary anyway i don't know what happened to me it was so tiny so i don't know if people someone had kept it as a pet or you know these things escape because people do all sorts of things yeah and there it was and i thought so i put my glasses on and i thought this is a bloody scorpion. So I thought, what the hell do I do? And you know what? I just left it there because oh, I didn't know what to do. So I thought, I don't know what to do. And it sort of burrowed into some sort of, there was sort of leaves and things. And I thought, it's a flipping scorpion. You know, <laughs> what have you just done? Left it. But I suddenly, it was my, you know, we were saying about that you become, it was an experience. Does that yes. make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And even if it was weird, I thought, oh, well. And that is not the way that I would react usually. Mm. Let me tell you, because I'm not a fan of insects, let alone scorpions. But Interesting, isn't it? Yes. And I thought, you, you've just let a flipping scorpion just go. Yeah. Thought, oh, well. Yeah. And, and I don't know if that's a good or bad thing, but... Um, our perception, our senses, for me, have totally changed. Yes, very much. Like, haven't the skies been amazing this year? Yes. Because we're noticing them because we're not so busy. True, true. I mean, there I, seems to be uh, yeah. a lot... Some people are very busy mm. and very much under a lot of pressure at work, and some people have a lot more free time. But whether you're busy at work or not the free time that you have is very different. And there seems to be more time to notice, to me. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, definitely. And the things that you notice are also about oneself. Yes. Very much so. I, I notice when yourself. I'm... Yes. And I notice mm. when I'm being a bit intolerant now, mm. for example. <laughs> When I, 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 I left work to come and do this mm. and I, my son, my eldest son works with me now. And I said, right. I'm, I'm really sorry that I was a bit intolerant earlier. And he said, no, I'm sorry that I was intolerant. <laughs> oh, I know we wouldn't, we wouldn't have said that before, but we're more well, aware. Well, that's nice. Mm. That's very nice. So tell us a little bit. This would be a good moment. A little bit about about all the things that you do, because you do so many different things, Claire. I do so many different things, and I can't really explain how I do it, but... As if by magic. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Yeah. I think I have a different perception of time 
to other people possibly mm. but before before lockdown I would work two or three days a week in my retail business mm-hmm. and uh, then I would be coaching people mm-hmm. and uh, teach maybe three or four yoga classes a week um, and uh, going to gym classes I had a personal trainer I learn aerial skills, so I learn silk trapeze and aerial hoop. I love aerial hoop. It's oh really my lovely. goodness! It looks, wow, it looks really pretty, but actually, it's brutal. It's really painful because that hoop does not move. You kind of have to bend yourself around it. It's hard to explain. But it's very painful. Anyway, it looks pretty. Is it like a pole um, dancer type of thing? Well, it's like a ring. Move. It's like a mm. ring that you sit in and you make shapes. It's rather like, interesting. Like trapeze is a bar with ropes, so the ropes move. So you have that mm-hmm. bit of movement in the the equipment. Mm-hmm. But the aerial hoop, the hoop doesn't move. So it looks really good, but it's really painful. But anyway, I love it. I mm. love it. So so that was my life. I I had a you know I had what I would describe as my perfect lifestyle. In the summers, I performed can-can at festivals sometimes. I was mm-hmm. part of a can-can troupe. And I also was on festival crew. Uh, so I'm a, a nanny for a family who work at festivals and I look after their children. Or uh-huh. okay. spend so- the day with their children and then I get the evenings free. So what sort of festivals um, were you doing, Claire? Uh, so Glastonbury and Shambhala with the family. And they mm-hmm. are makers who sell through my shop. Mm-hmm. Um, so they would do felt making and drum making workshops for people who booked into them, who were people who are at the festivals. Mm. And then I would go to the kids area or go to the circus area or go and uh, watch some kind of cabaret that was suitable for families. Uh, or we would just go and sit and eat ice cream in the sun or go and find a cool place to sit. Uh, Really nice job. And I would help with domestic chores, like collecting water and washing up and all that sort of thing. Mm. And then in the evenings when they finish teaching workshops, then I'm free to go off and do what I want. So I sort of collect festival friends to go off with in the evening and go and watch bands. Uh, and dance, dance until three or four, usually once or twice at a festival. Um, and I love dressing up and putting glitter on and all that. So, so I had pretty much the perfect lifestyle. Um, mm. but, but interestingly, in what feels like quite a short time, I feel quite well adjusted to this new lifestyle. Do you? Yeah, which is very much less glamorous, I must say. So what has changed, do you think? Uh, so obviously the whole festival thing's gone. <laughs> yes, I mean, apart uh, from the, yeah. And um, that was a big social scene for me. That was that was my uh, kind of, I'm a very sensory person and I love all the colours and, and all the, I just love the theatre of it all. Mm. And the sort of feeling a part of something. Um, And I I sort of did grieve that to begin with, but actually I feel like I had quite a nice summer without it, which is interesting because I live in a second floor flat and I don't have my own garden. That's interesting. Yeah, it is Mm. interesting, yeah. Um, and, And I have a little silver teardrop caravan that I tow festivals so that's in storage uh and of course my retail business which which um was very much a part-time thing for me has become very much a full-time thing because obviously I want that to survive this uh period of opening and closing so I've been putting very much more effort into that uh which is um actually really satisfying and it's you know I had to go through a lot of resistance to learn new skills like 
how to uh, upload stuff onto my, because I've got two retail businesses, one of them's online. So how to upload products onto the online shop and how to work the online shop and how to deal with orders. and Ah, uh, that's, that's, I would find that impossibly difficult. Now, what's it called, this online shop? Uh, it's called madeinstroud.co.uk. Mm-hmm. So, so what does so, it sell? So we work with 160 makers and we sell mm-hmm. their work for them. So we have an off license. We have a license to sell alcohol. So we sell wine, beer, gin, mead, honey, whiskey, um, bubbly. Uh, Is that all from these enjoy. different people that have made these products? Yeah, all direct from the people who've made it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't drink, actually. I only drink water, really, and coffee. Um and then we sell some food products. So we sell like raw organic chocolate and really high quality, good, non-perishable foods. So we have a range of vegan food seasonings and loads of pickles and preserves and jams and a big range of chocolate. Uh, and then we also sell uh, clothing made from upcycled cashmere and lots of pottery and stained glass and jewellery and um, books and textiles, homewares, lampshades, cushions, all made by people that we know, actually. What a wonderful idea. Yes, and it was an idea that started in, I think, 1990 or 91, Mm -hmm. uh, when my eldest three children were really small And my husband at the time used to make these drums. And as I know now, like a lot of artists, he wasn't great at marketing and selling, but he was really good at making. Mm. And we were always trundling around the country to these awful events that we paid a lot of money for and never sold really enough to cover our costs. So I sort of thought I would look into having a stall locally and it was... The options were a bit limited, so I decided to hire a village hall, a church hall in town, and see Mm. if I could get 10 other artists to share the event. And and I got 36 artists, and I called it Made in Stroud. I ran a vegan cafe, had Kids Corner, because I had young kids, uh, had a busker, and and it went really well, and that's how the whole Made in Stroud thing started, really. Ah, okay. But As you a series also... of events. Uh-huh, okay. And, and the items. shops, mm-hmm. the shop is also a version of the online shop, is it? Yes, it is, but they're two separate businesses. Two separate businesses, mm-hmm. okay, all right. Yeah, but it is. So, so my eldest son, who started working f- with me in the last two or three years, mm-hmm. he set up the online shop, so we're both directors of that. So he's got a share in in that because he's put a lot of work into it and how is the online shop um coming along it's so good i mean i never thought i would get my head around doing all this work from my phone but i mean this evening i'm planning to sit on my sofa and add new products to the shop which have been delivered today because i can just do it from the delivery note it's not interesting I can sit on my sofa and do it. <laughs> and how, how bizarre. Do you, oh, my goodness. And how do you deal, Claire, with... Um, you see, I'd be a nervous wreck with that, um, logistically, because I think, well, what if I didn't send the product products out on time? How do you... When you get an order in, how does it work, the whole so thing? So we actually are in the physical shop from nine mm-hmm. till five every day. Mm. So we go in and we pack up all the orders and then we have one area for click and collect for customers who are going to come and collect stuff. So the orders come up on our phone. We pack them really nicely as if they're being bought from a really nice gift shop. And Mm. we write the customer's name on a little gift tag and they, they come and collect those. Then we have another area for stuff which is being posted out. So we have loads of cardboard boxes and all recycled packaging. Mm. We go to the post office every day uh, and uh, then we occasionally do the odd delivery as well, which we do in the evening, which is quite nice. It's quite nice to see where our customers live. They have the most beautiful homes. Oh, in my the goodness. Hills. Yeah. 
Like, That's an adventure in itself. I mean, in the summer, that was really fun, driving around mm. in my Mini with the roof down. Oh, that sounds like a film, Claire. Yeah. We did, <laughs> we did make a stop-motion film of, oh, did one, of you? Our, one of our journeys, yeah. yeah. Oh, that is interesting. Yeah, which is on our social media. So, so we work with people we know. They make everything by hand, so everything's fairly traded. They set the prices. Mm. We have loads of um, policies, environmental policies, like none of our soaps contain palm oil, for example. We've had that policy for like five years. Yeah. Uh, all of our bags have always been made from recycled paper. We've never used plastic bags. Mm-hmm. All of our greetings cards are either unpackaged or in plant-based cellophane, not in plastic mm-hmm. uh, envelopes, not in plastic kind of, you know, plastic uh, display thingies. Yeah. I know what you Yeah, I know. Yeah. Like there's this in, plastic envelope type thing. Yeah, so they're in mm. plant-based cellophane. Mm-hmm. Uh, we try to have as little packaging as possible and we, we try and encourage all of our makers to use the minimum packaging mm. and not plastic. Mm. So, uh, yeah, so we, we've... And we're, I was really lucky to find a, a shop premises which had been an eco-conversion of two old shops. And actually, when I met the um, premises owner, which was in 2000, he said, I'm, I'm looking for an ethical retailer. And I was like, mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> this could work. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, so that, that was so a stroke with, of luck. It was complete mm. serendipity. I was at the time organising Strad, Strad Farmers Market, which had been going for about 18 months. Mm. And I was hot desking in town with a charity, uh, Strad Valley's Project. And I had to find my own office because the freelance tax laws were changing. I couldn't be freelance in someone else's premises full time. Mm. Uh, and I just walked past this building one day and I thought... How have I never noticed that before? And there was a big sign in the window saying to let. So I got in touch with the letting agent and met the owner and did a really good deal for the lease. And I've been there since. Yeah. My goodness. You know, I think that everything moves in this sort of fateful way that um, I was talking to somebody else about this the other day. It's like, when you are on the right path and it's meant to be, then everything around you falls into place. I think, I think that's true. And uh, even when it doesn't, it's always possible to learn something from that experience. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, and it's about taking those opportunities. It's about actually, you know, when I took on that premises, I took Mm. it on as a farmer's market information point, so my office, and uh, as a shop, which I set up uh, with my uh, husband at the time as a cooperative of local local makers. So 25 makers, and they were all members of the cooperative. And it's, it's about taking that opportunity and not being scared to take a risk because I was scared about taking on the lease. And I sat down and worked out how much was the maximum I could lose, the maximum amount of money I could lose, mm-hmm. uh, and and how could I earn that back? So, that, so at the time, with the lease terms, it was like a maximum loss of two and a half thousand pounds. And I thought, okay, I, I could stack shelves in a supermarket in the evenings and pay that back. So I had yeah. I had a plan of, okay, if it doesn't work out, I'm willing to find a way to pay the money back. So so I'm taking that risk knowing that I've got a plan. And and the way that I justified taking that risk and moving through the fear of signing the lease was to imagine myself as a really old lady who hadn't taken the risk. Oh my goodness. And how would I feel? if I hadn't done it. So then I was like, okay, I can feel regret when I'm older or I can possibly get a job that I wouldn't normally have to do 
to pay off if it doesn't work out. And I think that's quite a good way to make decisions. I think it's an excellent way. I've never heard of that way before, actually. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I like to sort of imagine myself as, honestly, it sounds really morbid, but on my deathbed, if I was on my deathbed and I didn't do this, would I regret it? Hmm. Or if I was on my deathbed and I did do this, would I deathbed and I did do this, would I regret it? It's like quite a good way to decide things, I think. It's a grand finale type of thing, you know. Yeah, um, because there they, are so many opportunities in life. Yes. It's so yes. easy not to take them because of fear, fear of failure. Mm-hmm. Or even worse, fear of success. You know, fear of mm-hmm. failure is pretty straightforward. Fear of success is fear of doing well and not being good enough to meet people's expectations. Yeah, yeah, very true. But then... And it, we're never free then, are we? Because we're always living no. in the shadow of other people's opinions. Yes, and other people are always going to have opinions, so you may as well give them something to have an opinion about. Yes, and usually people that... Um, I mean, how many... Look, how many people out there are living? It's mostly existing. You know, how many of us are actually living? It, it, it takes a huge amount of effort to follow one's dreams it does and courage and the thing is yeah uh, if you look at successful people then they get an awful lot of criticism especially if you look at successful people on social media they get an awful lot of criticism so Mm. now if I get like personal criticism I just think well I must be doing something right then yeah Uh you know, if we were to listen to every sort of negative person that says things, we would never live our life. Yeah. And because because that culture is quite acceptable, people don't see uh, anything wrong with it. You know, I can fall into it myself, that kind of quite snipey, uh, negative thinking even if I don't write it on social media. But the thing is that although it's very fashionable, it doesn't benefit us. And I think as a society and in education, there isn't that much um, time and information about actually going and grabbing your dreams and doing something other than what's expected of you. So people yeah, really don't know what to do with it. I sort of excuse them because they don't know what to do with it. They're sort of told to, you know, if you look at the mainstream media, print media, for example, mm. the way that successful people are treated in, in print media, it kind of gives the impression that, that, that that's okay to be personal and unkind and, and very judgy. And, and actually, it's a really great thing to put yourself out there to be judged as if it doesn't matter because it gives people the opportunity to think, well, maybe I could do that. Maybe I could do something that I've always wanted to do. Mm. Because you work as a coach as well, don't you? Yeah, so I work with entrepreneurs and creators. Uh, I usually work with people for three months. Okay, tell us a little bit about that because that's sort of... That is something that people need at this time, I think, is this guidance. Because where fear is at the main agenda, we, we need something. We need a balance that gives us the courage to pursue the dreams, as you say. Yes, and we can still live our dreams, if, even if it, that's in a different way at the moment. Mm. Um, we can still show up every day do everything we can to be positive, uh, create, uh, nourish ourselves, connect to our higher selves. We can still do all of that. And the way that I work is with rapid transformation with people to help them to achieve their goals. So I don't know if you've heard of Tony Robbins. Yes, I have, yeah. Yeah, so I went to Tony Robbins' uh, Unleash the Power Within event two years ago. 
I've heard of that, yeah. Yeah, and I found it really transformational. And I met a coach there and I started working with this coach, uh, I guess two years ago, yeah. Uh, and I worked with him for a few months. Um, and I went back to Tony Robbins and I was on the fire team helping to build the fire because there's a fire walk as part of the event. I'm fascinated with fireworks. Tell us a little bit about that. So we spent 24 hours building an enormous fire Mm. uh, as a team of 100 volunteers. And then we created 13 fire lanes. And then everyone who was at the event, which I think was 12,000 people, they all got to walk the fire with training from Tony Robbins, very specific training from Tony Robbins, which included not only mindset training, but hypnosis, group hypnosis. Okay. So the first time I did that as a participant, I walked the fire. And what happened? Very surreal. And and that taking the first step, it's so, so symbolic. Taking the first step is so terrifying and yet so necessary. And then to just keep walking to the end, one foot in front of the other. And and we were taught that, you know, for a whole 12-hour day, the technique. And as a participant, I went home and thought, did that really happen or was it a trick? (laughs) Was was that real fire? Yeah. Did 12,000 people really walk over red hot coals, which are like over 1,000 degrees hot of heat? And then going back as fire team I actually shoveled the fire from the massive fire into a wheelbarrow and wheelbarrowed it across and and made these this fire lane with with a team with my team and it I think it was the most frightening thing and the thing with most responsibility that I've ever done in my life being on that fire team such a responsibility and I can actually imagine. to see yeah, and to actually see people overcoming their fears and to work as a team, shoveling mm-hmm. more hot coals on and the person at the end has a hose to wash the people's feet off and, like, very focused, very um, very tight teamwork, making sure that everyone's safe. Uh, I know that it definitely isn't a trick and it is indeed a real red hot fire. And it, it's so symbolic of what we have to do in life if we want to really live our dreams is to take that first step. And, and Tony Robbins talks a lot about that sort of thing. How the hell so can I've, you do that, Claire? How can you walk over hot coals of fire and not get burned? What is that? Uh, I think it's about being very decisive, being very quick. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's just uh, like you have two highly trained uh, Tony Robbins trainers who make sure that you're in the right um, mindset before you do the walk. It's something you can only do with very highly qualified coaches. It's not something that I would ever facilitate. Mm. Um, And... It's about learning a technique. Like many things in life, it's about learning a specific technique and then following the technique and having trust in the people who are training you. It goes way beyond that, doesn't it? Because, I, you know, you can see people in all the sort of ancient traditions and in India and all sorts of places, you know, these mystical sages that can immerse themselves into fire and Nothing happens to them. Or ice. I did that. Yes. Bim Hof ice. Oh, did you do that? Bath workshop as well. Yeah. And how was that? That was also fascinating because it's also about mind over matter. So we did a lot of breathing exercises and Mm. learned a lot about the physiology of cold and how cold is good for our immune system and how the body reacts to cold. There were a lot of lectures as well as a lot of yoga and breathing exercises. And then we actually got into a paddling pool full of ice, like submerged. And, and oh my goodness, I've seen yeah. people do that. I, I know also people that have done it. And um, it's quite 
um, astounding, I think, in how people do this. I'm fascinated, you know, fire and water are, you know, two of the most powerful things on the planet. Yes. Um, but what is the lesson from this? This is the thing. You know, there are I many think, lessons. Uh, it's partly about um, the elemental nature of it, of working with elements, mm-hmm. being outside. Yeah. But it's also about overcoming fear, learning techniques and trusting teachers. Mm. And always being teachable, I think. Is it also about being able to trust oneself ultimately? Yeah, I guess, because, because you know, you could die from getting into an ice bath. You could have a heart attack if you didn't approach it correctly. And um, I have heard Tony Robbins talking about somebody who went to one of his courses and then ran a firewalk without having the qualifications and the participants ended up in hospital with third degree burns. So it's like, it's, a, it's about being a student as well mm. and yeah it's about trusting oneself and I and I think pushing oneself pushing one's physical limits is uh, a really good preparation for dealing with life when life gets a bit tough yes which is always now. the case I think <laughs> yeah <laughs> especially yeah like, like yeah. life is so challenging now and I think for me, the fact that I have become quite physically fit since my mid 40s, so I'm 57 now. Mm. Um, in my mid 40s, I started to get physically fit because I had four children and I didn't really have a lot of time for fitness and I started to make time for it. Mm. And really taking more notice of my nutrition and doing more personal development work, I feel has put me in a place to be able to manage this as well as I can, to manage this situation as well as I can. Mm -hmm. Although like everyone, I have mm -hmm. those days where I just think, oh, are we doing this again today? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I mean, we all have that. We all have that. And I think um, yesterday I was going somewhere and I had to deliver some things and I remember thinking well I'm going to go a completely different route to deliver this um it was work related that I had to go and do it but I thought I'm going to go and deliver this in a completely different way I'm going to go completely into the countryside and I ended up down a road that I'd completely forgotten about and I forgot yes. there's a lake at the bottom of the road nice and um I thought oh there's a lake and I suddenly stopped and I thought this is life you know those yes. unexpected moments yes of natural beauty yes and I think I appreciate that much more this year mm. I have been lake swimming with friends a couple of times this year in between have you yeah in between lockdowns mm. I went lake swimming swimming a few times and and it was so enjoyable to be in the middle of a lake surrounded by nature oh I just felt like such a lot of energy from that experience without sounding like a hippie which I clearly am it doesn't matter so what (laughs) (laughs) hippie's good hippie's good yeah (laughs) It, it it is it's rekindling the part of us I think that is so connected to nature I got so excited about this lake I wasn't going to go swimming um but I got so excited because I could see the sunlight upon these sort of waves on the lake. Yeah, and beautiful. Like, oh, my goodness. How did I forget about this, you know? Yeah. And I got so excited. Yeah. I got I really out of the car. car. Yes. You know that feeling of feeling alive again? Yes. Claire, you know, yeah. Yeah. Um, like a new sort of. I suppose it's a little bit like having a, a a spark moment of love. Yes. I think that this year is a bit like the volume has been turned up on life. And sometimes that's a good thing and sometimes it's a terrible thing. Mm. So 
So for me, going to big supermarkets is a terrible experience and something that I don't enjoy. Mm. Uh, Neither do I. At this time. And Mm. that, that is amplified. But equally, going out into nature or going for a walk with a friend or going for a swim is something that the enjoyment of that is amplified as well. That's the truth. Yes. So I try to stick to the things that are nourishing to my soul. And amplify those moments. Yeah. Yeah. So so I try and really be conscious of my diet so that so that I feel optimum. I have the optimum amount of energy. Mm. Uh, and drinking a lot of water, staying hydrated moving a bit I haven't been moving very much the last couple of weeks um getting fresh air appreciating the sunshine shopping in places where I feel that there's some friendly connection for me yeah because there are other places to buy essentials other than big big supermarkets uh and just when I see someone I know in the street, just actually pausing for a conversation. Mm. I'm really appreciating that time together. Which, which I don't think we did before, because for myself, I was always rushing around doing the next thing. The art of conversation. There is an art to it, isn't there? Yes. Mm. Asking someone how they are. Mm. I'm not aware that I did very much of that before this year. And and listening to what they say. And then maybe checking in with them later in the week to see how they are, if they weren't in a very good space. Well, that's a very kind thing to do. And I think one of the things as humanity, as us as human beings, is... Maybe we'd forgotten a little bit or maybe a lot in some cases of these basic needs of communicating with each other. And um, I know we were speaking about this before we went um, on air, but tell me something, Claire. What have you found the most um, significant change in people and with regards to communication? Well, the most significant change in myself is that I don't Mm. feel lonely by myself anymore. Whereas having brought up four sons who are now all grown-ups and living by myself, I used to find winter a very lonely time, especially Mm. because I spent all summer at festivals and used to go travelling, have been to Goa, and last year I went around the Greek islands on a sailing boat, on a yoga holiday and diving. Yeah, fantastic. Amazing. I I used to find winter a bit dull and lonely, but because I have become more accustomed to my own company, I actually feel quite cosy this winter and not lonely. Well, that's rather beautiful, isn't it? Yeah. And I... Making friends. In a way with yourself. Yeah, and I'm and I've got more time for people because I've got less going on. Mm. So yeah, I I've FaceTimed my friends rather than texting my friends, for example. That's a new habit that I've got into since March. Yes, I mean you we still are social creatures and yes. we still need that. It it's it's impossible for human beings to be alone I think yes yes and you know just chatting about nothing is great Mm -hmm. like nobody's got that much to say because nobody's got that much going on really (laughs) (laughs) yeah 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 yeah. But, but just that actually seeing somebody else's face and seeing their expression and checking in and yeah I just find that really enjoyable it's also about this transference of energy, isn't it, with people that um, yes. is, yeah, we can see when we're meeting with them or when we're close to them physically, but 
But there is another connection, isn't there, that exists between all of us? Yeah, like our soul connection. Mm. Yes, absolutely. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And I know that you do Reiki, don't you, Claire? Yeah, so I am a Reiki master. I don't really use Mm. my Reiki very much. I usually only use it on myself, really. Mm. I just think that that awareness of the fact that we are, in fact, all energy. Yeah. And that there is energy that we can have, have access to, which we can't necessarily see. Um, it kind of puts a different perspective on things for me. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, I first I first started practicing Reiki in my twenties. Uh, we were living in TP community in Spain, and there was a visitor. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Uh, I had three three young children so my oldest three boys were six four and two and or six four and three when we were there Mm. Uh, and there was an English visitor who offered to initiate us all into Reiki which was amazing and I'm not sure if I had heard of Reiki before I can't remember but seemed like a good idea and um as wild as it sounds, she did the Reiki initiation in this waterfall, which was had those tiny little rainbows in it from the sunshine. Oh, my goodness. I know. And then we all sat on this big rock by the river, which was called Jacob's Rock, Mm, mm. uh, and had a chat about what Reiki is and, um, you know, to respect people's boundaries and only give people Reiki if they ask for it and that sort of thing uh so that that was quite a profound experience for me and I didn't really like using my Reiki because I didn't like being that in tune actually I find it a bit overwhelming I suppose I was quite young and from quite an ordinary background Mm. went to quite an ordinary comprehensive school I found it all a bit much really but, but it was always there in the background. And then about eight years ago, I was on a retreat in uh, Mallorca with Lynn Franks mm-hmm. uh, in the north of, north of Mallorca in Dea, uh, at a place that she had there at the time. And there was someone who was offering to give me Reiki too uh, by the pool overlooking the ocean. So I did, I did my Reiki too there. And then when I was doing my yoga teacher training last year or a few years ago, I guess it was three or four years ago now, uh, one of my friends, Julie, who was doing the yoga teacher training is a Reiki master and offered to uh, do the Reiki master attunement with me at her farm in Wales. Um, so, yeah, it's... I suppose it's a bit of a journey. I I never really know what to say about that sort of thing because it's difficult to express some things in words. But I I would say it has changed my perception. Tell us a little bit about, for people out there who don't know, what Reiki is, Claire. Well, it's just really hands-on healing where the person doing the healing is just really channeling the healing energy that is in the universe. Sounds a bit la-la. Not at all. But actually it sounds completely sane. But I do sometimes have occasion to give people a bit of Reiki and I was giving someone Reiki recently. I can't remember what the context was. Mm. But I could really feel the heat coming out of my hands onto them and they could really feel the heat as well. Yeah. It's it's interesting how I have no idea how it works uh, yeah. or what it is, but but you know there are a lot of things that we can't see which exist. For instance, the color spectrum is much larger than the colors that we can see with our eyes. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Yeah, there are so many sort of crystals as well. 
um, that we've only seen a small array of crystals that actually exist. Yes. You know, simple things like that. Yeah. We think just because we haven't seen something, it doesn't exist. Yeah. Or because we the... don't have the ability to see it. Yes. Yeah. 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 It's yeah. interesting. Mm. It's interesting. And, and do you think that, you know, I often think about this guy, I think, well, quite possibly maybe now is the time in this world to see those things that we haven't been able to see before because we have that space now to do that. Well, I do think for myself, I've been very busy consuming for a long time, mm. whether it's consuming holidays or experiences or shopping. And uh, that has very much changed this year. And there's been a lot less doing and a lot more being. And mm -hmm. I think given the right environment, that can be really beneficial for us. Yeah. But, but again, it's about surrounding yourself with those people. For instance, in lockdown one in the UK, I was part of an international peer coaching group. And we met every Saturday evening for two or three hours. And um, just talked about our week and there was one rule so mm -hmm. so this was uh facilitated by someone who's a coach who's trained with tony robbins yeah and who lives in america jeff loback and uh he set up the group and there was a few of us in the uk someone in portugal sometimes there were people from america and the one rule was that we don't talk about covid mm. So every week I had this two or three hour conversation with people about how our week was going and what our big decisions were that week, whether it was about how we spend our time or what we feed ourselves or what we consume in terms of media. You know, yeah. are we watching the news or are we listening to relaxing music, for example? are we dancing around the living room or are we glued to the television? This kind of thing, because our physiology and our feelings are so very much connected. Yeah. And I, and I feel that that is, uh, that I'm in a very privileged position to do, to, to have that in my life. But then again, the reason why I'm in that privileged position is because I put myself out of my comfort zone and went to that four day training course in London by myself, not knowing anyone there. So it's about taking risks, even yeah. though we are afraid. Yeah, taking good risks, mm. not mm. dangerous risks. <laughs> well, yes, I mean, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. But sometimes what seems dangerous at the time is only our perception of it. Yeah, yeah, like, like setting up my own business or... Yeah. Um, going it alone after my children have grown up or um, setting myself up as a coach, all of those things, kind of terrifying but necessary. Training as a yoga teacher, because I thought I'm not like, I'm not, I'm not your typical yoga teacher. You know, okay. I'm not in my 20s, I'm yeah. not tiny, I'm not terribly flexible. But I thought but I would do the yoga teacher training anyway to get more of an understanding of the practice and the traditions. I think that's ex absolutely outstanding to be, you know, to have the courage to do that. Yeah, but, um, but actually I found that there's a great demand from older people for, much, for a much gentler yoga practice. Oh, ah, okay. Yeah, and... and you know, I'm not able to teach yoga at the moment because there simply isn't enough of me to go around mm. because I have, you know, family commitments and work commitments. Yes. But, but certainly during the first lockdown, my classes were really popular with people who had attended studio classes with me uh, where I live and, and I was teaching on Zoom. And, yeah, there, there's... It's interesting how my perception of what a yoga teacher is and what yoga students want 
uh, was actually really different from what what people actually want is some space and some time and to stretch and breathe and go into themselves and feel part of something and just learn a bit about a tradition. And feel that sanctuary within, that that yes. peaceful state that yeah. I think we all need, even if it's half an hour a day, but that we give ourselves that respect. Yeah, absolutely. And that time, isn't it, Claire? Uh, absolutely. And, and for me, that practice, whether it's um, being more meditative when I'm doing my housework and washing up, uh, or whether it's practicing yoga or sitting quietly with a candle mm. and just observing my breath. Because I did a Vipassana meditation as well when I was younger. Oh, did you? What's that yeah. about? It's, it's a 10-day silent retreat where you learn how to meditate. I've heard of these silent retreats. Yeah, it's really profound. did that in my 20s yeah. as well. Oh, my goodness. Tell us a little bit about that. It's a, a tradition taught by, it was taught by Goenkaji. So he's now passed on. But when I learned the tradition, uh, I actually went to a course in France where he was teaching. Mm. Um, and he was exiled from Burma. Really interesting person who just taught this traditional uh, Buddhist, but not sectarian uh mm. meditation where you observe the breath actually yeah uh just learn to sit and be with the breath and you would sit for like eight hours a day you weren't allowed to have eye contact with anyone no reading no writing no obviously no phones phones weren't invented then anyway mm. um yeah just no contact with the outside world for 10 days just meditation and teachings a seclusion uh, in a way yes mm. kind of kind of i don't always think of it as buddhism for westerners really but the main thing that i learned from those teachings was that unwanted things happen and wanted things do not happen and that say that again say that again. unwanted things happen mm. and wanted things do not happen oh life. dear Yes. <laughs> oh dear. Isn't that the truth? Yes. Mm. So yeah. So although I am, you know, part of me at the beginning of the first lockdown was a bit of a toddler about it because I didn't want my business closed and I wanted to go to festivals and I wanted to see my friends and I couldn't, you know, it, it didn't take me it only took me a week to decide okay, I'm going to start teaching yoga every morning, Monday to Friday from 7am to 8am. I'm going to interview people who inspire me. I'm going to set up a YouTube channel. I'm going to share the interviews because I knew that if I didn't do some good with the time, I would feel I was wasting my time. Does that make sense? Absolutely. It feels in a way a waste of a life. Yeah. Like mm. I had to do something mm. positive. Mm. Yeah. And I think there has been so much positive that has come out of this situation. So many neighbours talk to each other now. Where we live, there's this incredible project called The Long Table, oh. which uh, is a um, surplus food cooking project. I'm going to describe it all wrong, but you can look it up, The Long Table Stroud. Uh, and okay. they, as a group... Um, cooked and distributed 36,000 meals over lockdown. Wow. Yes, and it's a pay-it-forward scheme. So anyone who can't afford food can have free oh. food. And, oh, and, and Yeah, and then the cost of producing a meal is, I think, £3.80 or it might be £3.60. Mm -hmm. So as someone who's buying a meal, you can pay... Three pounds eighty, the cost of producing it, or you can pay five, six, seven pounds, which pays for someone else to have a meal. So this project, they they have uh, a premises in town, 
uh, or just out of town and they have lots of chefs working there. All of the food is donated surplus food from producers, allotments, uh, supermarkets, uh, catering establishments, and uh, they cook nutritious, delicious meals. And they also do a children's range now. And then they have a freezer of love in a lot of the um, communities around the town. So I think they have 12 freezers of love at the moment. Mm. So each community has a freezer. You can go and help yourself to meals out of the freezer. And then you pay online whatever you can afford. So if you can't afford it, you don't pay anything. Like a lot of people, a lot of self-employed people, obviously are really short of money. Yeah. So if you can't afford it, you don't pay anything. Uh, if you can, you just pay what you can afford, what you feel like paying. And it's the most extraordinary project. And and I think... What a fantastic idea. Yeah, and, and they're trying to um, kind of document it and roll it out as a national project. And, and they launched, in between lockdowns, they launched a Friends of the Long Table scheme. Mm. So I joined that. So I pay £5 a week. To belong to that and I can go and help myself to a meal every week I haven't got round to that yet but I did go and get a few meals recently and they were delicious absolutely what did delicious. you have what, what do they well have? I'm a vegetarian so I had uh, uh, a vegetable curry mm. uh, there was I uh, can't remember I can't remember there was one vegetarian sausage casserole that was amazing Oh, wow. uh, yeah really good food really good and at the at the launch of the friends mm. um which was in between the lockdowns uh the the way that the project was described by the founders so i don't know if you have heard of this program called the baker boys which was on television no, I haven't what so that? it was about uh, a family bakery who make sort of sourdough and artisan bread. So mm. Tom, who was on that television programme, uh, is one of the Baker Boys, and he's the founder of The Long Table. So he was talking about how there's this myth that people without money don't enjoy quality food and that yeah. people who are poor have to eat rubbish food and how, you know, the aim of The Long Table is to completely bust that myth and, you know, offer people who are not in a position to be able to afford good food to actually be able to enjoy good food. And how often can they go there, Claire? Well, the freezers get filled up according to use, so they're just monitoring. So the, the freezers of Love are a new development that have happened since lockdown one, mm. and the project are just monitoring um, how quickly the freezers get emptied to decide how how frequently to refill them. So I think, you know, people can help themselves to whatever they need, whenever they need, basically. And it's all of the food's frozen, so you just take it home, put it in the freezer, use it when you need it. And there's no stigma to it, you see, because everybody pays online, so nobody knows who's paying and who's not paying. It's an absolutely remarkable project. It's a genius project. My and they, they would like to roll it out around the whole of the UK. That would be so wonderful. To do. And it runs as a social enterprise rather than a charity. So it's mm. connected to the local food bank and they're in neighbouring premises to the food bank. But it's very much not a charity. It's a social enterprise and it's their aim is to stand on their own two feet financially through contributions. And they're money, managing to actually do that, are they? Yes, they are. Yeah. They need to get a thousand friends in order to fund what they would like to fund in terms of staff. Okay, so people that can pay regularly. Yeah, you pay a five yeah. pounds a week. Yeah. Yeah. What a wonderful project. That's just... I know. It's really what? exciting. Oh. That sort of thing's really exciting. Yeah. Because because food poverty has been an increasing issue in this country. Yeah. in the last 10 years and for that to be in, in some way addressed uh, mm. through lockdown I think is a really exciting thing. You know it gives a little bit of hope and joy 
doesn't it? Yeah. To know that there's people out there with such fantastic ideas. Yeah, and so many volunteers there. I, I know people who volunteer there and they're really good chefs and they're just giving their time for the joy of being part of something which is good for the community. Beautiful, absolutely beautiful. And where is that available? Uh, so if you look up uh, the long table, I'm going to just look it up on my phone quickly now. Okay. And find out what their domain name is. Ah, the long table online dot com. Okay. So people can go there and find out about this um, yes. wonderful project. Oh, I really and support it if they want to. Yes, become a friend. Yeah, and yeah. support it indeed. And you know, hopefully that will then, you know, give um, more funds and more opportunities for it to go nationwide hopefully yes yes hopefully yeah wonderful yeah a wonderful project my goodness yeah. yeah wow now I wanted to ask you something Claire about mm -hmm. what is it that has kept you really positive and inspired to keep doing the things that you do in these times? Um, it is wanting there to be a community when we come out of the end of this. Mm. Wanting there to be a robust community when we come out of the end of this. So, you know, keeping the online shop going and working six days a week on the online shop the reason why I do that is because I want the makers to have enough income this Christmas that they can carry on doing what they love and what they're good at. Wow. Yeah. Because, because, okay, I've got two businesses. One is the shop and I'm mm. furloughed. I'm furloughed from the shop. Yeah. Uh, and I could just sit at home for a month if I wanted to. Um, but if I did that, then for the makers, they would have no income this Christmas and that would be pretty miserable for them. And even if I just show up every day for six days and do the most that I can do, at least it gives them hope. Yeah. But what has happened is that both myself and my son have both been working six days a week. Actually, this week we've both had a day off because we realised it wasn't really sustainable. But actually, with the amount of social media marketing we've been doing and the amount of new products we've been adding to the online shop, we're actually getting, you know, about probably half the sales that we would get in November. And all of that is going to keep the makers being able to make, give them a small amount of income, keep them really at the forefront of people's minds when it comes to gift shopping um, and just give them a sense of being part of a community and being important. This is important as well and I think a lot of people have found their creative side during these lockdowns and are doing things yes. they, thought they would, haven't they? Yes, I've got a friend who's crocheting and making pom-poms and yeah, a lot of people, my mum's just knitted 10 hats. A oh. lot of people are getting into crafting and it's, it's a really good way to spend our time, actually. I have to say I'm not one of those people because that's, you know, that's not what I do at the moment. But That's not your bag at the moment. Not at the moment, but yeah, I think it's brilliant. I think it's brilliant and it's so relaxing. Yes, and, and it takes you away from the... I think for me, any activity which takes me away from the news yeah. is a good activity. So I, so personally, I listened to the first announcement in March. Yeah. Uh, I think it was on the 26th of March. That was the last announcement I listened to. because, And that was the last time I listened to the news because I figure that if there's anything that I need to know, somebody's going to tell me. 
because yeah. most people are listening to the news all day every day and it's really it's actually really bad for our adrenal system all of that stress all the time it puts us into fight or flight all the time and our bodies are only really designed to use that mechanism two or three times in our life not two or three, two or three times an hour yeah uh, and stress is a massive killer and i think I think, you know, all of the talk of health and everything, what we haven't been hearing is how to protect our immune systems. And That's very rare to hear that. Yeah, we're not hearing that. Mm. And, you know, hydration, relaxation, you know, connection, um, nutrition, all of those things are so important. Connecting with our higher selves, um, religious practice, if you have one, I don't. Um, all of that is really important for our immune system. That is the natural way to boost the immune system by doing all of these things, such yeah. as, you know, with diet, as you said, as relaxation, and really flowing on a different wave that's, than is flowing at the moment out there. Yes. But riding... Yes your own wave that is your natural body's rhythm yes telling you everything that you need to know yeah and 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 you know i do have days when everything annoys me but as soon as i notice that i'm in that state i try and turn that around in some way by talking to someone or doing some practice or putting some music on and dancing um i i try and turn it around as soon as i can so i don't get stuck in that feeling it's it's always it happens to us because we're human and you know I I always refer it to being I said I'm actually feeling a bit spiky today yeah you know it's that spiky yes. feeling yeah um, I can't really explain it but it's like the energy is not within it's sort of reflecting out there and it doesn't need to be out there it needs yes. to be within so yes always what helps me I don't know about you Claire but I do something practical like I will uh, clean something or um, do something creative, yes. but not just get away from that feeling. So take the energy from out there and bring it back inside. Absolutely. My flat's never been so clean as this year. <laughs> it's a good use oh, of that energy. Yeah. <laughs> and it gives us a, a sort of sense of control over our environment. Yeah. Which yeah. is a good thing. Well, I mean, you know, discipline is one of the sort of major things in elevating oneself. Yes. Is one has to be disciplined, whether that be not listening to the news all the time. Yes. Staying away from those people, unfortunately, that you may have known for years, but just irritate you because they're not flowing on that same energy as you. Yeah, but that's don't fine. serve you. Don't serve yeah, you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and, you know, recognise that everything in this life is temporary. So yes. appreciate every single moment that we have doing something that's worthwhile. Yes, because I think if if there's one thing that we've all become aware of this year, it's our own mortality and the mortality yeah. of those around us. Mm. And that has to kind of give us an appreciation of, yeah, the here and now. I like what you said and I know it's sort of people would say well it's a little bit sad and maybe it's a little bit sort of morbid but you said earlier on about you know if I was an old lady and I hadn't done it and yes. would I regret it and yeah you know it, that's such excellent advice because I think we have to think like that in every moment because every moment is an opportunity to do something and if we miss it we miss it. It's gone. Yes. Yes. And it's never too late to start. It's never too late to think, actually, I'm going to go onto YouTube and find a meditation that works for me. Yes, that's a good idea. And also, what are your what's your YouTube channel called so that people can have a look at these inspiring people that you interviewed, Claire? Oh, I'm on Instagram, Facebook and YouTube as Claire Hennyfield Coach. Mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. I think it's Claire Hennyfield Coach. I haven't looked at my YouTube since last lockdown because I've been so busy. And people can get hold of you. Um, do you have a website? Uh, well, we've got the shop website, which is madeinstroud.co.uk. Mm -hmm. uh, 
or yeah, Claire Honeyfield Coach on Instagram or Claire Honeyfield Coach on Facebook. And are you happy for people to get hold of you in that way, Claire? Oh yeah, absolutely, yeah. And, and make contact. Most, most people are great. And if they're not, there's always the block button. <laughs> yes, indeed. I mean, sometimes that would be rather useful in life. I think. Yeah. I think it was. <laughs> oh dear, dear. Oh my goodness. Oh. It's been really a pleasure to have you today. And thanks, um, Amy. It's really nice to meet you. Thank you for asking yeah, me. Yeah, it's a pleasure. And you know, it's so wonderful to hear stories about people who are doing such wonderful things out there. And something that's really close to my heart is, you know, the creativeness of you and what you're offering out there for people who are creative and what, you know, a method to sell their things, to be creative, you know, it's, yes. it's a beautiful circle of life and yeah, it is wonderful. And as we come to the end, I wanted to ask you actually, um, and I always ask my guests this at the end is, what advice would you give, Claire, to people out there, whatever that has helped you in your life or is helping you now, just to remain positive and to be really sort of vibrating on that higher level? Well, look at the people around you. So the people who sur you surround yourself with are going to reflect on you. So, you know, look at who you surround yourself with. Look at what you eat and drink. And look at how you spend your time. And it's it's not about making massive changes. It's about making tiny little changes consistently. Mm. Building up good habits. And treat yourself as if you batter. That's important. Yes. Because you do. Because you will matter to a lot of people, whether you realise it or not. We don't realise, do we? No, not at all. No. That's beautiful advice, actually, is to, you know, remember that, is that we do matter. And firstly, we matter to ourselves in how we respect ourselves is how we respect everybody out there. Yeah, and a lot of people forget that they matter, yeah. especially in hard times like this. And I think it's really important to remember that. Yeah. Beautiful advice. Thank you, Claire. Thank you Thanks very much. Me. Thank you. And, thank you. Um, you know, I wish you all the best. And thank you thank for you. sharing a part of your life and Thanks. a part of your story. It's very inspiring, I have to say. Thank you. All right. Then we look after yourself. Yes. yes. And hopefully we'll me meet in better times. Oh, I hope so. Face to face. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Indeed. Yeah, okay, that would be a treat. Oh, that would be indeed. <laughs> All right, then. Take care. Thanks, Mimi. Bye. 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 Claire Honeyfield. It's so delightful, really, to meet such interesting people from all walks of life. Wonderful. Thank you so much for joining me. And look after yourselves. Until next time, lots of love. Thank you for listening to Secrets for an Inspirational Life, brought to you by your host, Mimi Novik. Please remember to subscribe to the podcast and see you in the next episode. For more information about Mimi Novik and her books, music and inspirational work, take a look at her website, www.miminovik.co.uk.